I want to start off, inshallah ta'ala, by telling you the story or part of the story of a well-known sinful person. This is a man who lived in the second and third century of the Islamic calendar. And his name was Abdullah ibn Maslama al-Qa'nabi. Basically, in his younger life, he lived in the town of Basra in Iraq. And in Iraq, in the town of Basra, he was known to be like the town drunkard, right? So they would often see him stumbling about town, drinking, you know, kind of out of his mind and this and that. And a lot of people would just, when they would see him and his friends, they're like, oh, the hooligans or whatever, they would just ignore them. And so one time, Abdullah bin Maslam al-Qa'nabi, he's in the marketplace and he sees a crowd of people gathering around someone. And in his drunken state, he gets very curious. And he stumbles over to the crowd, and he starts pushing people aside. And he's like, who are you talking to? Who is this? Why is everybody so concerned with this individual? Who is this? And they say, this is Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj. And he says, and who is Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj? Who is that? And they say to him, this is the famous scholar of Hadith, Shu'bah. Like people are like, how do you not know who this is? And he goes, okay. He goes, anta muhaddith. He says, you're a muhaddith. And now, you know, he's stumbling and, you know, he's kind of slurring his words. And then he turns to him like he's now, this is basically, this is Abdullah bin Masnama and Shu'ba talking to one another in a crowd of people. And he goes, fahaddithni. He goes, if you're a muhaddith, give me a hadith. Tell me a hadith. And now, subhanAllah, this great scholar, Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj, he looks at this guy, he's like half out of his mind, he's stumbling all over the place, and he's like, what am I gonna say to you? He goes, Ma anta min ashab al-hadith. He goes, you're not from the people of hadith. Meaning, in order to, for me to transmit a hadith to you, in order for me to narrate a hadith to you, you have to be in a better state of mind. And it is very evident from your behavior right now that you're not from the people of hadith. And then Abdullah ibn Maslama, he says to him, he goes, Hadithni illa. He goes, give me a hadith or. And he says, or I will strike you. I mean, I'm going to beat you up. And so finally, Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj, he gets quiet for a while. And then he begins to say to him, he said, it has come to us from Mansur, who narrated upon Rib'i, who narrated upon Ibn Mas'ud. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتِ He says to him that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If you have no shame, then do as you like or do as you wish. And Abdullah says that when I heard these words, it struck me like an arrow in my chest. He said, I was left speechless. He says, as it felt like I was knocked to the ground. And so when hearing these words, the words of the Prophet ﷺ being told to him that if you have no shame, if you don't feel shyness, if you feel no shame, then do whatever you like. You're going to make a scene in the marketplace. You're going to walk around drunk. You're going to abuse people, cuss people out, whatever. You have no respect for a scholar of hadith or whatever. You lack shame, then do as you like. And so he says, this really got to me. He says, I ran home, I took all my bottles of wine and I poured them out, I locked the doors, I told my mother, if anyone comes to see me, any of my friends come to see me, tell them that I don't want to see them. And he sat in that state for a while, and then he pondered and thought about his situation, and he said, what am I doing with my life? I want to be like Shu'ba, I want to be like him, I want to be a carrier and a narrator of hadith. And so he asked the people of his town, he said, who is the most knowledgeable person in the world today? And they, they say to him, today the most knowledgeable person is probably Imam Malik. Where is Imam Malik? He's in Medina. So now Abdullah, he travels all the way to Medina and he studies with Imam Malik. And he becomes one of the students of Imam Malik. And he studies and he studies and he studies until he feels like he's gotten everything he needs to from Imam Malik. And then he asks the people of Medina, who is the second most knowledgeable person on the face of this earth? And they say to him, Shu'ba. He says, Shu'ba? From Basra? From Iraq? They say yes. So he rushes back. You know, it, it wasn't a short flight back then. It took a long time. But he rushed back. He came all the way back to Iraq, to Basra, to study with Shu'ba ibn, ibn al-Hajjaj. And as he arrives in Basra, he starts looking for Shu'ba and he finds out that Shu'ba has passed away. 
However, we find that Abdullah ibn Maslama al-Qa'nabi continued on to study. And today he's considered one of the great scholars of Islam. And he narrated from many different scholars. Obviously, he narrated hadith from Imam Malik. I believe he has a, uh, about 100, 130 or so narrations mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. But when it comes to his teachers, amongst them, they have listed Imam Malik and others. But also amongst his teachers, they have listed Shu'ba. Did he study with Shu'ba? No, he didn't sit with Shu'ba. He didn't study with him. But he did learn one hadith from Shu'ba. And so under his teachers, it says Shu'ba. And the hadith that he narrated, it's been mentioned, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَصْنَعْ مَعْشِئْتِ If you have no shame, if you don't feel shy, then do as you like. Now my brothers and sisters, I share this story with you because a lot of times, one of the ways that we are tricked by the shaitan is that we feel that if we're going to sin, we don't want to be hypocrites. Right? And I know a lot of times, you know, we're told that the dangers of living a hypocritical life and having a double life, and indeed that is something which is extremely dangerous. And indeed that is another spiritual problem, and I believe a lot of it was talked about. But there's another side to the story as well, or the other side of the coin. And that is living a life where a person says, look, I don't care. If I'm going to sin, I'm going to sin. I'm not going to hide my sins. I ain't no hypocrite. And similarly, sometimes, subhanAllah, you, you see someone who's backbiting someone, someone else, and they use the same argument. They're like, you know, why are you backbiting this person? They're like, I don't care. I'll say it to their face. And you're like, that doesn't make a difference. That doesn't change the sin from being backbiting to not being backbiting, right? Now, actually, if you see it, say it to their face, it might be considered abuse. So now you have a sin upon another sin, right? May Allah protect us. Backbiting is simply to say, as Prophet told us, to say about someone something that they wouldn't like, right? Whether you say it to their face or behind their back, or you say, it, you know, you mention it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever it may be, doesn't make a difference. If you say something about them that they don't like, that becomes backbiting. Whether you're proud to say it or not, whether you feel good about saying it or not, doesn't make a difference in this sin. As a matter of fact, when we publicize our sins, when we boast of our sins, when we talk of our sins, when we tell others of our sins, this is an indication of a larger spiritual problem. And that is a lack of haya. That is a lack of shame and modesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Kullu ummati mu'afa. He said, all of my ummah can be forgiven or all of the sins of my ummah can be forgiven. Illa al-mujahirun. Except those who publicize their sins. And the Prophet ﷺ said the example of that person who publicizes their sin is the person who goes in the night and they commit a sin and Allah covers them. Meaning Allah doesn't expose their sin. Their sin was done privately. And then in the morning time, this person wakes up and he begins to tell the people, last night I committed such and such sin. Last night I did this and I did that. When it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who had covered up the sin. And in the morning, this person exposes their own sin. Hiding our sins can be a good thing. It's a good thing if we hide our sins out of regret. It's a good thing if we hide our sins because we feel the weight of our sins. And that is why I always differentiate between positive regret and negative regret. Positive regret for me is regret or shame that leads a person to repentance. That leads a person to repent to Allah, to repentance, and to seek Allah's forgiveness. Meaning a person feels bad about their sin, they feel regretful, and then they turn to Allah and seek Allah's forgiveness and Allah's help in getting over that sin. Negative regret is not good, as it says, negative, right? Negative regret. Negative regret is very often times from the shaitan. Negative regret is when a person feels so bad about their sin that they either lose hope or they stop caring, right? A person feels so bad and then the shaitan comes to them and says, you're just a bad person. You're just a bad Muslim. Why do you even bother? Allah is never going to forgive you. You're never going to get past this sin. You're never going to be able to get rid of this bad habit or this bad behavior or whatever it is you do. And a person feels so bad that they give up. They lose hope in their own ability and, and even more severe than that or more dangerous than that is losing hope in the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help them. And that's why I often tell people that if you have lost hope in yourself, then at least have hope in Allah. 
If you don't believe in yourself, if you don't believe in your own abilities, if you don't believe in your own capabilities, then have belief and believe in Allah's ability to help you. Have firm faith that Allah has the capability to help you because Allah is capable of anything. And that is what we're talking about when we talk about positive regret. That a person feels bad, a person feels some type of shame. And you know, subhanAllah, this is a problem that our scholars have talked about for a very, very long time. But in this day and age, this problem is almost compounded because of our friendly internet, right? Because we have so many avenues and so many ways of publicizing our sins, publicizing our faults. And subhanAllah, how many times have we met someone, and I can at least tell you personally, I've, this happened to me quite a few times where I meet someone who, you know, finds Islam at some point in their life, or they start practicing Islam, or they become more spiritual, and then they want to change their life or something, and, and they're like, wait, but I have a whole history of public sinfulness and it used to be like back in my day you know like I'll tell you look when I did stupid things I'm just alhamdulillah like eternally grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that like we didn't have YouTube and we didn't have MySpace and things like that right some of you know this but I used to be in a band before I accepted Islam uh, a punk rock band music that most people wouldn't like anyway right besides the fact that it's music and one of the things that till this day I make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that this was pre-YouTube because I know for a fact the first thing that would have happened is somebody sees me here on stage. Oh, sorry, this name. Let's see what's going on about, you know, let's see what's going on YouTube. And then at some point they'd come across like a, a track that we recorded or something or whatever. And remember this, Allah forgives. Allah forgives very easily. It means nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive. But people are not the same. It is very difficult for people to forgive. People may even forgive you, but things will remain in their hearts. And that is why sometimes a person may commit a sin and they hide their sin and they feel bad about it. And they make tawbah and no one finds out about that sin. And this sin is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah forgives them and they're done. But on the other hand, a person commits a sin publicly and they publicize that sin and they repent to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives them, but the people don't forgive them. And that is why this ruling that I found in some of our uh, books of, of Qadha, in some of our older books of Qadha, which I found to be very strange because you know, in this modern time it seems very strange when someone would commit a sin that would become widespread and wide known. Let's say, you know, in like a Muslim society or whatever, someone commits zina, right? And their zina is publicized and everyone finds out that they commit zina or whatever. And then they make tawbah or they've done a sin that people have been affected by. Sometimes the qadi would say part of your tawbah is to move somewhere else. And, you know, as a student reading this, I'd be like, why? Right? Like, why would you have to do that? And the reason is because this is pre-internet, right? Pre-social media. Where now a person can move to a place where, you know, they don't have to deal with a people who will shame, constantly shame them for the sin that they've committed. Right? And that sin goes back to being between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have hope that Allah will forgive them. And inshallah ta'ala, the last point that I want to mention is this. Our hiding of our sins, as long as it is done for the right reason, inshallah ta'ala is a good thing. It means that we care. It means that we care about this sin, we, we regret what we have done, and we want to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.